Hi, my name is Jean. I'm a graduate student at Emporia State University, where Dr. Jensen and I have been investigating whether or not behavioral tendencies present reproductive trade-offs in Dixisols. And essentially what we're looking at is phenotypic variation in animal behavior, which is an action or group of actions in response to some stimuli and can be influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. Behavioral tendencies are the consistent individual differences in behavior, otherwise known as an individual's average level of behavior. Behavioral types are a specific combination or suite of behavioral tendencies, so they are an umbrella-like category such as boldness, activity, exploration, aggression, and sociability. Specifically, we're interested in two of these behavioral types, Boldness and activity. Boldness is an individual's reaction to any risky situation, such as predation, and activity is an individual's basic level of activity when there is no threat. And each of these exists along its own gradient. Boldness is known as the shy bold gradient, where you have high risk behaviors on one end and low risk behaviors on the other. But an individual isn't necessarily considered shy or bold. They can exist anywhere along this spectrum. The same goes for activity, where you have more or less active individuals, independent of whether or not they're bold. So our research not only investigates this relationship between boldness and activity, but also how it affects three different components of reproductive success, nest depredation, brood parasitism, and nestling condition and how it all affects their overall reproductive success or fitness. So we've chosen the dick sisal as our model species. It winters in Central and South America, then comes up here around mid-May to early August to breed, where it prefers to nest in grass clumps. It is polygynous, so one male can have multiple females nesting within his territory, but the parental care is primarily female. They're also commonly brood parasitized by the brown-headed cowbird. And cowbirds are thought to use their host's behavioral cues to find the host's nest in which they lay their eggs. And each time they lay an egg, they may remove or replace a dick sisal egg and thereby reduce the host's reproductive success. Likewise, after hatching, cowbird nestlings often outcompete the host nestlings, further reducing reproductive success of the host. So what we've done is spend the last two summers out at the Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve finding nests by either tracking females using their behavior or randomly flushing them. And we found a total of 182 nests spread across four different fields for our two seasons. And once we found a nest, we monitored it twice a week until it was either fledged or failed. Uh, we, uh, while we were there, we collected both female behavior and nest content information. So a typical monitoring session can be broken down into three different parts. First, there is the preliminary observation, which is five to 15 minutes long, depending on whether or not the female is actively incubating. We stand 40 meters away and collect things such as chip rates. These are the alarm calls made by the female. Perch height, so whether she perched above, at, or below the grass canopy and proportion of time spent visible. These would be our measures of boldness, but we also looked at other things. We looked at rate of movement and rate of provisioning trips. These are our measures of activity. We then approach the nest and flush the female. Everything after this point is considered a measure of boldness because we have become an active threat to that female. So here we measure flight initiation distance, FID. This is the distance that the female was willing to allow us to get to her before flying away. We also looked at post-flush behavior. This is how the female came off the nest. It's ranked on a scale of one to five, one being the least risky, such as flying over the horizon, and five being the most risky, which is performing a vocal distraction display, not unlike a broken wing display of a killdeer. We then move 40 meters away and begin our secondary observation where we take the same measurements, but we've replaced provisioning trips with latency. Latency is the amount of time that it takes for a female to return to the nest after flushing. Once a female returned, we stop the secondary observation. If she did not return within 25 minutes, then we halted the observation at that time. So what we've done essentially is uh, take all of those female behaviors, run them through some Kendall correlations to decide which of those we came up with these 
10, which needed to be put into a principal component analysis, which reduced them from 10 variables to three. Three principal components, PC1, 2, and 3. PC1 explains just under 35% of the variation in our data. And it can be described as boldness or general boldness because all of these variables are positively loaded onto it, meaning that they are all positively correlated. So if a female tends to be bold in one of these, she's also going to tend to be bolder in another. PC2 explains 22.7% of the variation in our data and 57.6% uh, cumulatively with PC1, and that's very good for a behavioral study. Uh, this one can be described as reactivity. So what you'll notice is that all the variables taken during the preliminary observation before we flush the female are negative, and all those taken after we flush the female are positive. So it's telling us that females behave differently before and after flushing the female. And females who receive a positive score here are females who increase their level of boldness. They performed more risky behaviors after we flush them as opposed to before. PC3 explains just under 10% of the variation in our data, so we still included it because it could be informative, um, but it can be described just simply by these two uh, variables which are loading highest onto it, latency and post-flush behavior. We then performed a series of generalized linear models and compared them to each other uh, to predict for parasitism by cowbirds. So we not only looked at parasitism rates, so whether a nest was strictly parasitized versus not parasitized, we also looked at parasitism intensity. So if a nest was parasitized, did it have one egg or multiple cowbird eggs? And we looked across at this uh, across several different strata. We had a female strata for strictly female behaviors, a male strata for male and male influence behaviors, a time strata, as well as an environmental strata. And the environmental strata was the only strata that did not have an effect on either parasitism rate or intensity. So if we look at our time strata, uh, first we notice that um, although the confidence interval does include zero for initiation date, that uh, there is a negative trend here. So as it gets later in the breeding season, so 140 would be about mid-May and 200 Julian date would be uh, near the end of July. Um, as it gets later in the breeding season, nests are less likely to be parasitized and year was an important factor for both parasitism rate and intensity. So we see a difference in rate as well as intensity. So for example, although 2020, um, Nests were less likely to be parasitized, parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds. They were more likely to uh, have multiple cowbird eggs in their nest. Uh, these differences between years could be due to several factors that have to do with the differences in populations between 2020 and 2021 because we are different, dealing with different individuals each year. For our female strata, both boldness and reactivity affected parasitism rates. So if we look at just PC1, which was boldness, females who scored positively and who were generally bolder were less likely to be parasitized, uh, as well as for females who increased their level of boldness, who, whose behavior became more risky after we flushed them, they were also less likely to be parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds. If we go over to our male strata, uh, something interesting that we found was that after we approached the nest and flushed the female, um, the more a male chipped at this point in time during the secondary observation, the less likely the nests in his territory were to be parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds. We then took all of the top models and informative models uh, from all of our different strata and ran them through a competitive pooled strata um, where we looked at all of those models together and the top model for that competitive strata had secondary male chip rate, year, and initiation date as covariates for the top model. So this is essentially what the effect of secondary male chip rate uh, would have on the probability of parasitism if you take year and initiation into account. Um, and there is that still uh, that basic 
negative trend. So in summary, we uh, performed a principal component analysis, PCA, to create three different composite spores, boldness, reactivity, and then latency and post-flush behavior. And then we compared those to our brood parasitism. And not only did we find differences between years, uh, in general, we found that as initiation date increased, female boldness and reactivity increased, as secondary male chip rate increased, as all of those increase, the likelihood for parasitism decreased. Our future analysis will do the same thing for nest depredation and nestling condition. I'd like to thank my committee members, Dr. Rebar and Amberdar, as well as Dr. Martin and my assistant, uh, McKenzie, for their hard work, Emporia State University and Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve for allowing me to do my research, as well as the Grassland Heritage Foundation for their generous funding. Thank you.